It deals only with valence nucleons, only with certain configurations, has a simple Hamiltonian. It's a boson model because it treats nucleons in pairs, two fermions approximately combined to make a boson. And, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Augusto showed a uh, picture of his predecessor, the, the, the slightly more famous Machiavelli, and that inspired me to show some pictures of me. And so you have to put up with this. Um, no. There's me at an early age. Here's me as a graduate student. Which one is me? There? <laughs> no, that's no, a 40 year old no, accelerator no. operator. Anybody else want to make a guess? Uh, the next one to that. Uh, that? No, no, no. That's the, this? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, this one. No, but no. he's an interesting guy. Okay, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> you notice I'm telling you. Yeah. I'm already a teacher. Um, so that's me. Um, this guy is a guy I actually referred to already. He's uh, a guy who did his thesis on uh, Coriolis mixing in the SD shell and became an astronaut. And he's the one who told me about the problems with the Coriolis force in space. Okay, there's me on the Alec Gletcher in Switzerland. There's me playing tennis. And I think now a colleague of mine will show up. Oh, no, no, maybe, okay, that's me at Machu Picchu in Peru. And here's a colleague of mine. <laughs> my two kilogram chihuahua. And then I just decide to add a couple more. There's me at Mount Everest. There's, there's another friend of mine from Antarctica. And there's me in Antarctica. Okay, enough of that. Okay. Um, shell model configurations. Maybe we should delete those two from this. <laughs> um, too late. Yeah, okay, too late. Okay, so if you imagine a big shell model space, <clears throat> all the configurations, uh, remember we talked about 3 times 10 to the 14th for Sumerian 154. This, at least currently and maybe never, can, can be dealt with. It's just too big a space. And so you, it has roughly gazillions of configurations. And you need to simplify. And so the IBA takes a little piece of this. <clears throat> now, on a, if this were on a real scale, you wouldn't be able to see that. I blew that up probably by a factor of a, a billion uh, relative to its real size. <clears throat> because in Sumerian 154, you can make 3 times 10 to the 14th 2 plus states, and the IBA uses 26 of them. So you get an idea of the factor. And it just pulls that out and says, let's consider only this, and let's have the arrogance to think that that may represent nuclei, or at least the low line states. And here we just consider pairs of fermions that couple to either angular momentum 0 or 2. Uh, so I just want to very briefly talk about why the IBA, why such a crazy model, some basic ideas about it, and then we'll go into the main topic. So why the IBA? Why, why would you even think about a model with such a drastic simplification? And the basic reason is because it works. It's, I think it's fair to say it's the most successful general nuclear collective model for low-line states. It embodies a wide variety of collective structures in a single model that's easy to calculate, uh, it has all the observables, or many observables built in, energy levels, E2 transitions, E0 transitions, and so on. It's very parameter economic. Uh, most IBA calculations, not all, but most are two parameter, three parameter. It has a deep relation with group theory and dynamical symmetries and quantum numbers. And these quantum numbers are quantum numbers of the many body system, of the nucleus as a whole. Uh, you also have quantum numbers for the individual nucleons, but this is a perspective where you take a step back, or a few femto fem steps back, and you look at the system as a whole. Okay, why S and D bosons? I'm sure somebody showed this. Uh, and one answer is that if you look at nuclei with two valence nucleons, the ground state is always zero plus, next state is always two plus, so some approximation you can consider just those couplings. Okay? I mean, if you look at this, you might think, why not the others? And people have put in L equals 4 bosons. I don't know if anybody's done 6 or 8, probably. Uh, but these two seem to work pretty well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you can read this if you want. Uh, so um, those are a set of things I like. Um, 
Anyway, I just want to look at Sumerian 154 once more. In the shell model, it has 3 times 10 to the 14th, 2 plus states. In the IBA, you use these approximations, which I've just said, and you put those states in, and out of this pops 26 2 plus states. And it, to me, it's amazing that such a model can actually account for as much data as it accounts for. Remember, it's a collective model, phenomenological model. It can't tell you why a nucleus behaves the way it does, but give it, you have to feed it. You have to tell it some information about a nucleus. Once you've done that, it can predict a lot of other things. To understand why that particular nucleus does things the way it does, you need a more microscopic approach. Okay, um, you've seen a symmetry triangle of the IBA. This is not the symmetry triangle. This is an illustration just to point out that the IBA, because it's based on pairs of fermions, has a relation to the shell model. Because it produces collective behavior, it's related to the geometrical model. And so these are all linked, but it itself is an algebraic model. Okay, uh, this I, I just skipped through very quickly. The two operators, the two bosons are S and D, and so the operators are S dagger S and D dagger D. There are 36 of them because you have one uh, uh, S dagger S and you have 25 D dagger Ds because they have five magnetic substates. I'm sorry, you have one S dagger S, five S dagger Ds, five D dagger S's, and 25 D dagger Ds, just counting the number of magnetic substates. That leads to 36 states, and that leads to the group U6. Um, and so I want to do a very simple uh, few comments on the group theory without doing any fancy math or any of it at all. Um, you will see that, and maybe I said already or somebody else said, that another word for dynamical symmetries is spectrum generating algebras, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. Okay, uh, this I'm going to skip. I just put it for completeness. It defines generators of a group. These are operators that close on commutation. And here I give just an example. Uh, the commutator of D dagger S, S dagger S on a state with N D, S, D bosons, N S, S bosons. And if you go through the creation annihilation operator stuff, you come back with the same state and another one of these operators. So generators close on commutation. And there are, uh, and they also conserve a quantum number. If you look at this quantity S dagger D, it destroys a D boson, creates an S boson. So you come back to the same number, total of bosons. And so this commutes, and N is a conserved quantum number for these 36 generators. Okay, and those are just some definitions. Okay, you can have subsets of generators that define another group. Like, for example, the, the operators D dagger D, there are 25 of them. Five in each magnetic substate, so that's 25. They conserve, obviously, the number of D bosons. So this destroys a D boson, this creates it back, and so uh, states with the same N D are representations of this group defined by these, which is called U5. Okay, that's just a summary. I'm not going to go through that. Now what I want to do is the main thing that I want to do here. Uh, this I want to illustrate the idea of group chains and symmetry gradients. So suppose we start with a Hamiltonian which is extremely simple, namely H equals some constant times S dagger S plus D dagger D. And you can all solve that instantly. S dagger S is the number of S bosons. D dagger D is the number of D bosons. So this is equal to A times N sub S plus N sub D. N sub S plus N sub D is the total number of bosons, half the number of valence nucleons. And so that's just A times N. Okay? Now, that's a, so, so it only depends on the total number of valence nucleons. There's nothing else in there. That means that all the states of a nucleus defined by this Hamiltonian will be degenerate. There's nothing that gives a different energy to any of those states. As long as they have the same number of bosons, they're all at the same energy. There's no other term here. <clears throat> now, you might think that's not a very realistic model to have a model that predicts all the states in the nucleus are degenerate, uh, because we know that's not true. If you take a different perspective, it's not so bad. The next nucleus, two, nu two valence nucleons further, uh, has an energy 2 GeV more, because you have two nucleons. And the excitation energies we deal with are an MeV, so in some ways it's not even a bad 
idea, but it's not going to help you much in analyzing real nuclear spectra. <clears throat> so you have to add something to the Hamiltonian. Okay, and so here's the Hamiltonian we just started with. Uh, this one I call, now I'm going to define a new one, H prime, by adding in this term. So now I take this Hamiltonian, which had solutions A times the number of bosons, and I'm going to add a term B times D dagger D. And that's going to give a term in the energies B times the number of D bosons. Doesn't get too much simpler than this. Okay, now the energies depend not only on N, but also on N D. States of a given ND are degenerate, okay, but states with different ND are not degenerate. And so now if we make a level scheme, the first, the original Hamiltonian we started with, the states are characterized by the quantum number N. Here's a state at zero energy with, or wouldn't be zero, but I'm defining it to be zero. N bosons, N plus one would be up here at an energy A, N plus two would be up here with an energy 2A. Okay, now this would be a nucleus, like samarium-154, samarium-156, samarium-158. Now I add in this extra term, and within this nucleus, states of different ends of D now split up, and their energies are 0B and 2B. And now I can add further terms, etc., with further terms, and I get a spectrum. And each successive step in this spectrum introduces a new subgroup, introduces a new quantum number, and breaks a degeneracy. That's the idea of a dynamical symmetry. Maybe that helps. Okay. And here's an example for the O6 symmetry. You have the group U6, where the quantum number is N. That breaks up into levels defined by a quantum number sigma, which, um, who talked about this, Jan? Yes. Okay, so there's a quantum number sigma, sigma. Uh, and the energy depends on sigma. You go the next step. You have levels defined by quantum number tau, which is a little bit like a phonon quantum number. You have an energy depending on tau. You go the next step, and you introduce, uh, you, you split these levels according to their angular momentum. You add a JJ plus one term. And so you generate this spectrum. And so that's a spectrum generating algebra. Okay? Okay. Now, here's my uh, detailed description of the detailed group theory. You start with an S boson. D boson has five components. Whoops, that was too fast. They make U6. And here's the group theory. This is my understanding of the group theory. And it leads to three symmetries. One called U5, which is a harmonic vibrator. One called SU3, which is an axial rotor. One called O6, which is a squishy... Axial, or a, axially asymmetric rotor. If you have three things and you want to depict them in some geometric form, you might think of a triangle. And so here is a triangle where the symmetries are depicted at the vertices, and these are little mini level schemes showing the characteristic features of those symmetries. R42 is 2 here, R42 is 3.33 here, R42 is 2.5 here. A spherical, uh, a spherical vibrator is spherical, yeah. Um, okay, SU3 and O6 are deformed shapes, and so the triangle breaks up into a spherical region, a deformed region, and a transitional region. And Yan Jolie, I'm pretty sure, talked about, uh, yes, he did, talked about Landau theory and analyzing phase transitions across this line. He also extended the triangle up this way, uh, this is a prolate rotor. He extended it to an SU3 bar, which was an oblate rotor, uh, still a triangle. Um, and this is the um, whoops. This is the symmetry triangle of the IBA. And almost everything I'm going to talk about from here on in is going to be defined in terms of this triangle. The point is that <clears throat> for each of these vertices, for each of these vertices, you have a Hamiltonian which gives that structure at the vertex. The Hamiltonian for U5 is just H equals epsilon nd, the energy of a D boson times the number of D bosons. The Hamiltonian for SU3 we'll see in a minute or two. Uh, Yan Jolie talked about it in terms of Casimir operators. Hamiltonian for O6, similarly, you can write in terms of Casimir operators. I will write it a little differently. Um, and 
So those are the Hamiltonians for the three symmetries. And then anywhere else in the triangle, which represents a broad range of collective phenomena, you'll have a Hamiltonian which breaks these symmetries, and in which the no, no individual symmetry is valid. You have some state which is, I'm not going to say a mixture of symmetries, because that's uh, over a determined basis, but it's, it's in between the symmetries. Okay? And our job, when we deal with real nuclei, is to try to uh, take a nucleus, take the data, and try to find out how we can reproduce it with the IBA by being somewhere in the triangle and get the parameters of the Hamiltonian and define where it is. And if we look at a series of isotopes, we can see that maybe they vary from vibrator to rotor or something like that and understand how structure evolves. And it's a very powerful way of understanding how structure evolves in a, in a simple scheme. Okay, everybody okay to hear? Yes. I hope this is simple. Okay, so now I'm going to write the full IBA Hamiltonian. The simplest possible Hamiltonian you could write is epsilon nd, or epsilon sub d nd. Epsilon d is just the energy of a d boson. We imagine that the, since we're dealing with excitation energies, we imagine that the s boson is zero energy. And so the energy of states in this Hamiltonian is just the number of d bosons in the wave function times epsilon d. Okay, so it just counts the number of d bosons out of n. And so the energies for zero d bosons are zero. If you have a wave function with one d boson and n minus one s bosons, you'd have an energy, excitation energy of epsilon. If you have two d bosons and big N minus two s bosons, you'd have an excitation energy of two epsilon. And uh, so that's the simplest. You can add other terms. The, the, this term, as you see, uh, conserves the number of d bosons, but represents an interaction. And if you go back to this, you will remember that in the harmonic vibrator, you had a ground state, which is 0 plus, first excited state, which is 2 plus, because it has one d boson, and d carries angular momentum 2. And then the two phonon state was three states, 0, 2, and 4. And in the harmonic vibrator, they're all degenerate. If you introduce this term, you can break that degeneracy with these parameters. These are not the CJ coefficients of the Nielsen model, by the way. They're just coefficients. Then you can add, I just said that, and you can add other terms. These terms are extremely important. Uh, they maybe look complicated, but they're not so much. Let's take this term, for example. This destroys an S boson, destroys a D boson, and creates two D bosons back. So it conserves the total number of bosons, because you need to stay in the same nucleus, but it changes an S boson into a D boson. So if you have a set of basis states defined by the number of D bosons and S bosons, this will mix them. Okay, and similarly, this does something similar. Okay, I think this little two there is redundant. Um, okay. Okay, that's the most general IBA Hamiltonian with terms up to four boson operators for a given boson number. Okay? By the way, you can use the IBA to calculate masses and separation energies. Then you need to include a couple of other terms where the energies depend on the boson number, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay, so let's talk about this simplest possible case first. The Hamiltonian is epsilon nd, and I added epsilon sns, but we're going to set that to zero. Okay, so the energies are just simply epsilon nd. And you have this simple spectrum where the ground state has no d bosons, all s bosons. The first excited state is 2 plus with 1 d boson. If you have 2 d bosons with angular momentum 2, you've done the n scheme, you know how to calculate the angular momentum for that. You get three levels, 0, 2, 4. 3 d bosons, you get 0, 2, 3, 4, 6. And I think one of my early exercises had you do that or somebody's did. Anyway, it's just you can do it with the end scheme. And this should look familiar. It's exactly the vibrator model. There's one important difference with the vibrator model that we'll see in a minute. U5 is a more general scheme than this because you can break the degeneracies. But the wave functions are basically these. The wave functions consist simply of each level has a certain number of D bosons. All the rest of the bosons are S bosons, and that's all. 
Okay? I want to talk about E2 transitions in the IBA. So if you want to have an E2 transition, you have to somehow generate two units of angular momentum. And this is the most general operator that does it. It has a term D dagger, uh, sorry, S dagger D, that destroys a D boson and creates an S boson. That's obviously a change of two units of angular momentum. You do the opposite, D dagger S, destroys an S boson, creates a D boson. Again, two units of angular momentum. <clears throat> and D dagger D can couple to different, several different angular momentum, one of which is two. This is two D bosons. And there's an arbitrary parameter here linking these two. Okay? Um, <clears throat> in the vibrator, one sets chi equal to zero. And so the operator is just, let's say, this first term, S dagger D. And if you calculate um, this creation operator with these states, uh, you get something very interesting and very important. So let's start with a state. So we're going to destroy a D boson and create an S boson. So that's like going from the two phonon state to the one phonon state. Right? Clear? <coughs> we'll go, up, go from here to here. This has two D bosons. Let's, let's say we have six bosons total. This would have two D bosons and four S bosons. This would have one D boson and five S bosons. <clears throat> so, I want to calculate this matrix element. So we start off with a state, we're going to end up with a state that I defined to be ND D bosons and NSS bosons. So we have to start with ND plus one and ND minus one, NS minus one. So let's operate with this operator on there. And <clears throat> if you operate with the first one, the D, um, Oh, I did both steps at once. It's pretty simple. Okay, you get square root of nd plus 1, square root of ns, and this way function back because you've destroyed a d boson and created an s boson. Okay, that's just 1. And so the answer is square root of nd plus 1, square root of ns. ns is just the total number of bosons minus the number of d bosons. So the BE2 value, for example, in the ERAS levels from, say, the 4 plus to the 2 plus, or 6 plus to the 4 plus, is going to be some effective charge, it's a scale factor, times the square of this, nd plus 1, n beta, nd minus nd. Okay? Now, you will notice that as the number of bosons goes to infinity, this just goes to the number of bosons. Okay? And this looks something like what we got with the vibrator, but not exactly. Um, in the vibrator, what we got was, this is going to be on the next slide anyway. In the vibrator, actually I had it there. Okay, stupid. Okay, zero plus, two plus, four plus, if I call this BE2 one, this BE2 is two, okay? And that just comes from the creation and destruction operators. Here you have number of phonons, zero, one, <laughs> and two. So here you have two phonons, you can choose to destroy either one, so you have twice the probability as you do for that, right? That's the simple vibrator model, not the IBA. The IBA modifies this, and you'll see that there are two square roots here. In the vibrator model, you would just have this one. And the reason is a fundamental difference between the geometrical models and the IBA. In the geometrical models, these are phonon excitations, and there's no limit in principle to how many of them you can have. You can, they're bosonic excitations. You can have one. You can code. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? And you can have two, you can have three, superpose. You can superpose two of them, superpose three, and so on. In the IBA, every time you add a D boson excitation, you have to reduce the number of S bosons. Because the IBA is a form of a shell model. It's based on the valence space. It's based on the number of nucleons. So if I create a D boson, I only have a certain number of valence nucleons, I have to destroy an S boson. That gives me two square roots here, which gives a fundamental difference in the predictions, which you'll see on the next slide.
Okay, is that clear? So in one model, the phonons are what I would call particle hole excitation. You take a particle below the Fermi surface and raise it up. In the IBA, the, they're, they're D bosons, which are valence uh, constructs. Okay. And so you have these two square roots. And here are the predictions. So this is the ratio of the BE2 from the 4 plus to the 2 plus over the 2 plus to 0 plus. And if you take those two square roots here, what you get is the BE2 ratio from the phonon model, which is 2, times a factor n minus 1 over n. So look at this scheme here. Here, we, we define this to be 1 in our arbitrary units. This transition in, in the geometrical model would be 2. In the IBA, it's n minus 1 over n times 2. The 6 to 4 would be 3 times n minus 2 over n. And so here are some actual numbers. If I take n equals 6, and I call this 1, in the geometrical model, these two BE2s would be 2 and 3. In the IBA, they're 1.67 and 2. The 1.67 is 2 times n is 6, so 2 times 5 over 6, 2 times 5 is 10, 10 6 is 1.67, and you can go there. So the BE2s in a vibrator in the IBA are somewhat different than uh, in the geometrical model. And if you look at all the data on BE2 values in vibrational loop land, you find values closer to here. They actually average about 1.55. Okay. Okay, if we want to go beyond the simple vibrator model, we have to add something to the Hamiltonian. And so here was our full Hamiltonian, but that's pretty complicated. And for many calculations, we don't need all those terms. Now, sometimes you do. And sometimes for certain data, certain applications, you really need to consider the full Hamiltonian. I can't personally think in a six-dimensional space, so I'm going to simplify. Uh, and I'm going to truncate it just to two parameters. You're actually going to see a third, but I'll, I'll talk that one away. And then we'll bring it back this afternoon. So here's the Hamiltonian I'm going to use. Epsilon nd we've talked about. Kappa times qq. These q's are just linear combinations of some terms here. Okay? And then you'll probably remember from Yan Lee's lectures, there's always at the end of these group chains a group O3, which gives a rotational spectrum, JJ plus 1. So you can add a term here with some other coefficient times JJ plus 1. I put this in parentheses uh, for two reasons. I, never, I almost never use this term. I don't like that term. It sort of seems ad hoc. But you can use it. There's nothing, it's not a sin to use it. Uh, and I tend to think in terms of this Hamilton. However, for the exercises this afternoon, I'm going to, after you get introduced to the model and do some real calculations, you will see I've put a term like this into the input file. And I've done it purely because it will save you roughly an order of magnitude of work. Okay, it'll simplify greatly what you have to do this afternoon. And so I do include it, so don't be surprised when you see it. Um, this is the Hamiltonian I will talk about uh, for the most part. Okay, and we'll look at the properties of this. And they're very simple. So first of all, this Q operator, as I said, is a linear combination of some things up here. And it looks just like the E2 operator we saw before. S dagger D plus D dagger S plus chi D dagger D with some coefficient which you normalize to one of the experimental E2s. And chi is a, a parameter that you can vary. So this model has three parameters. It has epsilon, kappa, and chi. But now, remember, this is a kind of collective model. And collective models inherently don't have a scale, or you can take the predictions and always scale them. And so the key parameter here is actually, well, chi, and kappa over epsilon, or epsilon over kappa. It's only the ratio here which really matters. This is like an Ising model, where you have a competition of two different terms. And so epsilon over kappa is really the thing that counts. And so there are two parameters that affect the structure Epsilon over kappa, or kappa over epsilon, and chi. And then once you get a, a structure you like, you just scale the energies to match one of the experimental energy levels. So we know what epsilon nd does. It gives a vibrator. Q 
QQ, I know what it does. You don't, maybe. Um, it gives deformed nuclei. Okay, it's like a quadruple operator. And you will see that. Okay, as I said, more complicated forms exist, like that. This form works well in most cases. We will drop this JJ term in our discussion, but we will use it this afternoon purely for the sake of simplifying the calculations. Okay, so now I want to relate this IBA Hamiltonian to the group structure and to the symmetry triangle. What's the time? Oh, good. We're going to finish early, I think. Okay, so um, sometimes you see this Hamiltonian written with a plus sign and sometimes with a minus sign. And there's no real difference because sometimes the kappa parameter you put into the computer code is multiplied by minus 1 inside the code. Sometimes it's not. You can see that I did have a plus there. But to be consistent through the slides, I change it to a minus. OK, so this is the Hamiltonian. If we have only the n sub d term, if kappa is 0, we get a vibrator. right? We get this phonon spectrum. And so that term gives this spectrum. This term gives O6 if you put chi equal to 0. And it gives SU3 if you put chi equals to minus square root of 7 over 2, which is 1.322876, or something like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, why these numbers? Well, Pete can tell you that. Pete told me he derived this number. Right? It's the same number as in the SD shell in the area. Well, that clarifies it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Anyway, um, these numbers come out of the group theory. Is that fair to say? Yes. To make this, this Hamiltonian a generator of these groups, or written in terms of the Casimir operators. So. OK, so we have this Hamiltonian, and we have three cases that generate these three symmetries. Just n sub d, we get u5. Just qq alone, if chi is 0, we get 06. And if chi is minus 1.32, we get su3. And now it should be clear how you calculate anything anywhere in the triangle. <clears throat> you just, if you have both epsilon and kappa, you'll be somewhere in here. If you have chi, you'll be somewhere in here. And you will see in a minute where you will be for each of these. OK? It's already clear that since epsilon gives u5, and since these two symmetries are given by the kappa term, the epsilon over kappa, or let's say kappa over epsilon, somehow goes from here to here, right? If kappa is 0, you're here. If kappa is infinity, you're over here, or if epsilon is 0. So if you think of kappa over epsilon, often it's written epsilon over kappa, and it goes the other way, but if you think of kappa over epsilon, you're going from this point over in this direction. And it will turn out that chi tells you where you are along this line. OK? So this Hamiltonian allows us to calculate the properties of any nucleus anywhere in the triangle just by choosing these parameters. Now, how do you choose these parameters? You have to choose them by looking at some bits of data on each nucleus. So this, as I said, is a collective model. You can't, it doesn't tell you what, it doesn't tell you a priori what the nucleus will look like. You have to feed it with some simple data. OK, now I'm going to give you some examples of calculations. The first example is I'm going to give you an example of calculation for Erbium 168. And then I'm going to give you a calculation for a series of osmium isotopes. And then I'm going to show you some really remarkable predictions that are called universal, but they're not quite universal. Uh, and it's just going to use this simple Hamiltonian. OK? And then I'm going to tell you how to map the nucleus anywhere in the triangle using a technique called orthogonal crossing contours. Um, this one is what you're going to do this afternoon. This afternoon, you're going to do three trivial little test calculations just to get you familiar with the IBA. And then uh, you're going to uh, actually fit the properties of Erbium 168. If you remember back in probably, I guess, my second lecture, uh, we discussed Erbium 168 as a rotational nucleus with gamma and beta vibrations. And then you, um, in one of the exercises, 
you extracted the relative BE2s from the gamma band to the ground band. Can anybody remember back to the first week? And then you compared them with the Oliver rules. Anybody remember the Oliver rules? Okay. <laughs> and you found that there was reasonable agreement, perhaps surprising agreement, considering how simple they were. But you also saw disagreements. Now we're going to, and you generated the table. You actually generated the table from the 2 plus of the gamma to the 0, 2, 4 of the ground band. Now we're going to look at the whole table, which I'll give to you, and you'll see all the Oliver predictions. You've actually seen them. And you're going to fill in a column of the table with your IBA predictions by fitting the nucleus. I'll show you the results, but I won't show you the parameter value that gives the results. Okay, that'll be up to you to do. Okay, so let's get started on this. Okay, so... <clears throat> I'm going to approximate Erbium 168 as being along this line somewhere. Now, how do I know that? Well, I don't know it. In the early days of doing IBA calculations, we thought all nuclei were along here, and so we kind of dropped the epsilon term. Later, it turned out the epsilon term is important, and you really have to be in here somewhere, but you can do pretty well along here. And so I'm going to set epsilon equal to zero, and you're going to do the same thing this afternoon. So we're going to be going along this axis. Uh, oh, I guess well, I did say, but I didn't really stress it. Kappa over epsilon takes you from this corner over to the deformed limit. Chi takes you from SU3 to 06. Chi equals minus square root of 7 over 2 gives you an axially symmetric rotor. Chi equals 0 gives you a gamma soft rotor, the squishy thing. Okay? Kappa, since epsilon is zero, kappa is just a scale factor. So you just calculate with any kappa you want and just scale the energies at the end to match the first two plus state. And so the only parameter is chi. You'll do this this afternoon, but I'm going to show you the results that you can try to get this afternoon. Okay. This is um, a plot, obviously. Uh, this is the data for Erbium 168. And this is a complete set of levels. These are all the positive parity levels. Uh, and it's known to be a complete set. Uh, and these are the IBA predictions obtained simply by varying chi and picking the best chi. And I think you can see the agreement is pretty good. You have It's a deformed nucleus, so you get a ground band. You get a gamma band here. You get a k equals 0 band here. You get another k equals 0 band here. And you get a 2 plus band, and you have a 2 plus band, and then you get a little bit of discrepancies. But that's already up at 2 MeV, which uh, these collective models rarely work at. Okay? Not too shabby. It's a one parameter calculation. And uh, we fixed that parameter, I think, well, we fixed it by some properties of the 2 plus gamma, I can't remember what. Okay? Um, this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I just brought it up because you saw it before because I want to illustrate something. Remember we talked about the Oliver rules? So those are relative BE2 values from a state in one band to multiple states in another band. And in, for the case of a K equals 2 band to a K equals 0 band, these three transitions have relative values 70, 105, and don't be misled by the order I wrote that in. The 70 applies to this one, the 100 to the middle, and the 5, if you'll remember, was the small one from the 2 to 4. So those are the Oliver rules. The Oliver rules assume only a pure rotor with complete separation between rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom, and just they're just Lepschgorten coefficients. And the data look remarkably like the Oliver rules, but they also differ from the Oliver rules. The IBA, which includes much more physics than just that, should be able to do better. And we'll see in a moment. So this is a table I gave you in the first lecture, second lecture, I guess. Uh, these are the initial states. These are the final states. And these are the Oliver rule predictions for different K values. So if you're talking about the gamma band going to the ground band, that's K equals 2 to K equals 0. So the predictions from the 2 plus of the gamma band to the 0, 2, and 4 of the ground band 
are 0 0.2, 0 0.286, and 0.014. And if you divide this, make this 100, that becomes 70, and that becomes 5. So those are the numbers we just saw. And then here are the predictions for other initial states. Okay, you remember all this? Anybody remember this from three weeks ago? Anybody remember it? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, you remember it. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. This is the data for Erbium 168. And in the exercises on, I think, the first Tuesday, you extracted these numbers from this table. That wasn't hard. And you extracted these numbers from the data. <clears throat> that might have been pretty hard. I think you had a lot of pain and agony doing that because you had to take the gamma ray intensities and divide by e to the fifth. And I think all, all of you, especially the theorists, probably hated doing that exercise. But in any case, you got these three numbers. Okay? Well, 100 was pretty easy. You got 54 and 6.8. Okay, I hope you remember doing that. Uh, I hope you've forgotten the pain and remember, remember how satisfying it was to be able to do that. Okay, when you do the same calculation for Erbium 168 that I just showed you that gave those energy levels, this is what you get for the PE2 values. And I would say that it's pretty remarkable. Okay. Here you have the Allegor rules for these three transitions are 70, 105. The data is 54, 106.8. That's actually not bad. The idea, though, is 54, 107.6. There are no free parameters in this. Uh, from the 3 plus, you can go to the 2 and the 4. You get 2.6 and 1.0. 2.6, 1.7 is the data. 2.6, 1.8 is the IBA. Now, there's another feature here, which I haven't talked about. This 3 plus of the gamma band can decay to the 2 plus and 4 plus of the ground band. It can also decay to the 2 plus of the gamma band, right? An in-band transition, an inter-band transition. The allegorals say nothing about the ratio of these rotational transitions and these vibrational ones. They just don't say anything. The allegorals are just clutch gordon coefficients relating one initial state in one band to multiple states in the final band. But they can't deal with two different classes of transitions. So if I look at the transition from the 3 plus to the 2 plus of the gamma band, that's K, okay, the algorithm rule says nothing. The IBA, though, can predict it. And if I set that equal to 100, the IBA gives for these other two, 2.6 and 1.8, and the data is 2.6 and 1.7. So it's also calculating correctly the relative size of the rotational transitions and the ones between bands. And again, it's, it's, by this stage, it's parameter free. Okay, we fixed the one parameter. If you go to the four plus state, <coughs> you have transitions to the ground state, two, four, and six. Oleg is 2.7, 8.1, and 0.8. Experiment is 1.6, 8.1, and 1.1. Maybe you'll remember that the spin decreasing transitions are always smaller experimentally, and the spin increasing ones are always bigger. The IBA gives 1.7, 9.6, and 1.5. And that's on an absolute scale once you fix this one. So again, it gets the relative magnitudes of the intra-band transitions within the gamma band and the inter-band transitions between the bands. Okie dokie. Right. Oh, sorry, that's here. Five plus, it can go to the four plus and six plus of the ground band. Oliga 2.9, 1.5, data 2.9, 3.6. Look at that. Opposite way. Um, <clears throat> I had to normalize uh, this, of course, because it doesn't predict these. The IBA and the data are 122 from the 5 plus to the 4 plus, and 100 from the 5 plus to the 3 plus. And the IBA gives 95 and 100 for those. And on the same, in the same calculation, without a separate normalization, it gives these values for the interband transitions. So the 6 plus, I don't have to go through this in great detail. You can again see that the agreement is pretty remarkable. 7 plus, again the same thing. Uh, 
These are two transitions at the bottom within the gamma band, and this is to the 6 plus of the ground band. And those are more. Okay? So the model works exceptionally well. Now let me go back and for a moment. What I just showed you was here I showed you a whole bunch of energy levels, and I showed you the transitions the BE2 values within the gamma band and from the gamma band to the ground band. I have not yet shown you any transitions for this band or this band. <clears throat> and there are three things I can say about those. In the SU3 limit, and I'm not sure that anybody talked about this, the selection rule is that you get transitions between these two bands. In the geometrical model, <clears throat> excuse me, those transitions are forbidden because this is a beta vibration and this is a gamma vibration and the E2 operator can only just create or destroy one phonon so it can't both destroy a beta vibration and create a gamma vibration and so those are forbidden. In the IBA they're allowed and at the time these IBA predictions were made the fact that it predicted collective transitions between these bands was considered to be the death of the IBA. And the reason was those transitions had not been found. Okay, it turns out more sensitive experiments, remember these transitions are very low energy. So even if the BE2 value is large, the E gamma to the fifth factor kills the intensity. So eventually, experiments were done that found those transitions and instead of the death of the IBA, it turned out to be a very nice confirmation of this. Okay, so what I haven't shown you are transitions from this k equals zero band to the gamma band, which exist and are collective and are predicted by the IBA within a factor of two or three. The other reason I haven't shown this is the data rapidly diminishes as you go up, and there's much less data from this band or this band to these bands. And secondly, the model doesn't work as well. Uh, and there are two zero plus states here, and it's maybe not clear which one is which in the IBA and experiment. But anyway, there's still work to be done there. The IBA is not a perfect model. It calculates the low-line levels quite well. Yeah, it has some problems up here, but still, overall, it does pretty well. Okie dokie. Okay. Um, when we looked at this in the exercises, you had the Oliger rules, which is Klebsch Gordon coefficients, and you had this data. Now, you, you only saw this part of the table, I think. And you notice that the agreement was overall quite good, but there were obviously discrepancies. And someone asked me, how do you fix those discrepancies? So whenever you have a model that works reasonably well so that you know it has sort of a good part of the truth to it, um, or can represent the data reasonably well, but there are discrepancies, you try to use those discrepancies to tell you something. You use those discrepancies to see what extra degrees of freedom, what other things you could add. And what I said to the person who asked me is, well, you can modify this by introducing new degrees of freedom. And what I want to do now in three slides that are in parentheses, as you'll see, just mention briefly what, that, what you can do. Oops. Okay, so how to fix the oligo model within the geometric model. It's awful English. Um, anyway, what I want to do is see what you can do in the geometrical model to improve those predictions of the oligos. The oligo rules assume that each band is pure, a ground band or a gamma band. There's no coupling of vibrational and rotational motions because the frequencies are very different. And so it's just simply pure K values, same intrinsic structure as you go up the band, nothing changing, just clutch coordinates. That's obviously an idealization. And what you can do is you can mix the bands. You can say that there's some interaction that mixes the gamma and ground bands. And so you can write the ground band as a mixture of primarily a ground band wave function plus some tiny amplitude of a gamma. You can write the gamma band as a primarily a gamma band but some tiny amplitude of a ground band. Okay? And there's a formalism, which is very detailed. I'm not going to go through it. There's a technique called Mikhailov plots, which I'm not going to describe, but whoever wins the project for the best, wins the award for the best project can read about it in my textbook. 
Uh, the others will just be ignorant in the wasteland, not ever knowing about this. <laughs> in any case, it's a technique. And you can extract coefficients called Z gamma. Uh, you can see the BE2 values from the gamma to ground band are the unperturbed BE2s. These are the oligurals times 1. So if you don't have this term, you get the oligurals plus some function of the spins and a parameter called, or a coefficient called Z gamma. Z gamma is proportional to these mixing amplitudes, and so by fitting the data, you can extract Z gamma parameters, you can extract the mixing, and you can I interpret the data. And when you do that, you get very good agreement at the cost of an extra parameter. Okay, and this just showed, this is the end of these three slides, there's the parentheses. This shows Z gamma values across the rare earth region from erbium to osmium, and they have a nice parabolic shape, minimizing near mid-shell where you would expect the rotational and vibrational degrees of freedom to be most separated. Okay, that's the end of that parentheses. So before the parentheses, we were here, and now we're going to do the second. Remember, I had three sets of calculations, so here's the second one. These are what we used to call universal IBA calculations. They are along. One question? Yeah, let me just write one thing and then I'll answer. Mm -hmm. So you have this symmetry triangle. So first we fit erbium somewhere along here. Now we're going to do a series of calculations back and forth along here and look at how things vary. Um, yes? There is any interpretation about this parabola that you showed before? Uh, you mean this one? Whoops. Yes, this one. Um, there's a hand-waving one, which is that the separation between rotational motion and vibrational motion should be the, law, the best when you have the most valence nucleons, when the collectivity of the rotational motion is the most, which is mid-shell, and that's mid-shell. Okay. Now, you can do other models that predict that, sort of microscopic models. Okay. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, okay, so here's the Hamiltonian. It doesn't get too much simpler than that. Kappa is just a scale factor, so all we have is chi, and chi runs up and down along this angle of the triangle, and so we can plot any observable as a set of contour plots against boson number and chi. The IBA has the feature that the predictions depend on boson number. Remember over here, we had the corrections to U5. It had a boson number dependence. Because when you create a D boson, you destroy an S boson, and that depends on how many you have. So the predictions will depend on NB. They'll depend on chi. And so you're going to see, you're going to see contour plots where NB is the vertical axis, chi is this axis, and they're going to be contours of constant values of given observables. Okay, let me show you the data first. These, and you saw this in the first lecture, because that was kind of the introduction to the empirical evolution of structure, and now we're talking about trying to understand it. This says 2 gamma to 0 ground. So that's just the transition from the band head of the gamma band to the ground state divided by 2 ground to 2 ground. So that is, if I have the form nucleus 0, 2, 4, and a gamma band, that's this transit, whoops, that transition compared to this. So it's in turband transition divided by an intraband. We often use this one to normalize transitions. Okay, this is the data from the rare earth region. And you see the numbers are typically 0 0.02, 0 0.03, pretty constant. So it would be interesting to see if the IBA predicts that. Okay. I just varied chi and got those energies and then got these BE2 values. You saw this table before. It was part of the exercises the first or second day with transitions from the gamma to the ground band, the oligarols experiment, and now you see the IBA predictions, and they're just amazing. Uh, the algorithms only predict transitions between bands. They can't predict these in-band compared to the between, so 
There are no predictions for the oligos there, but the IBA gets the relative strengths of those correctly as well. And then uh, I wanted to look at some universal properties of the IBA along that same leg, and we're just about to do that. These are transitions from the 2 plus of the gamma to the ground state over the 2 plus of the ground band to the ground state. This is an axis that goes from 06 to SU3. This is boson number, and you see these values are predicted to be on the order of 0.02 to 0.06. And those are the experimental values exactly in the same range. And we'll skip that, and this is where I was. So that's a quick summary for those who missed the first part. I guess we're, okay, so we should start. Okay, um, so this is where we were. I had just discussed the fact that, well, never mind, I did that already. Okay. Um, let me make sure this is on. Yeah, okay. So, um, we talked about collectivity of the various vibrational excitations, and we talked about the fact that the gamma band is more collective than the K equals zero band, and experimentally, there's a lot of evidence for that. If you have a collective state, Think about, oh, I erased it. Think about this situation very early I gave you with n states mixing, and the collective one comes down and has many, many, many components. Remember, and you actually diagonalize a little five by five approximation to that, the first set of lectures, remember? And you found that the ground state wave function had almost equal amplitudes of a whole bunch of components. Okay? If you think of those as shell model configurations, and now go to the next nucleus, okay, you're going to have most of them still available. And so one property of collective behavior is that it doesn't change very rapidly from one nucleus to another. Okay, and here you see the data on the energies of the gamma band. Do you see how smooth it is? That's an immediate message that this excitation must be fairly collective. Okay, because, um, as I said, if you think in terms of a shell model space, you just add two nucleons. Most of the configurations that apply to the gamma band in nucleus with n neutrons will also be available for the nucleus with n plus 2, and so it won't change too much. If you have a weakly collective excitation with maybe only a couple of components, and you add two nucleons, maybe one of those components is blocked by the Pauli principle, and so states, the properties can fluctuate much more. This is the k equals 0 band, and you see it has much greater fluctuations. So if this is less collective than this, you'd also expect the BE2 values from this to be much smaller than this. And uh, so let me start off by pointing out also, not only does it fluctuate more, but the energies here are on the order of 1,100 kilovolts, and over here in the middle of the shell are on the order of 800. So the beta band, or the K equals zero band, is typically about one and a half times the energy of the gamma band uh, near mid-shell. Okay, that again, so two things point to lower collectivity of the beta vibration. The fact that its energy is higher, remember the end states and the one comes down. If the interaction is smaller, it'll come down less, okay? Um, and the fact that it's higher, so more fluctuations and higher energy, okay? Um, these are predictions now um, of the IBA for the BE2 values, well, the energies in the BE2 values. So this is the energy up here of the beta band divided by effectively the energy of the gamma band. Okay? And so we just saw in the previous slide that that energy ratio is roughly 1.5. You don't put anything into the IBA for this. You just, we're doing a calculation along this leg of the triangle and we just see what we get. And again, this axis is chi, which goes up and down this side of the triangle. This is boson number, and these are contour plots, contours, of constant values of this ratio. And what do you get? Well, over here in SU3, which is actually out here a bit, this ratio is, is basically is unity. Okay, and you can see it's going down toward unity. Um, and in the middle of the deformed region, where you have 14, 12, 16 bosons, uh, you get values on the order of 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7. It's exactly what the data says, and it comes out automatically in the IBS. 
Okay, the other prediction here is that the BE2 from this zero plus, uh, I, I drew it to the ground and said, obviously you can't do that because that would be E0, but uh, so think of this as the two plus of this gram to the ground compared to the gamma to ground, typically is 100 to 1 experimentally. And the IBA just automatically predicts values of 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. So it gets it, okay? And it's almost magical the way it works so well. Okay, um, so I've had two things that I did so far to illustrate the IBA. One was Erbium 168, which you will do this afternoon. And the second was these universal plots along that axis. The third is a sequence of predictions for the osmium isotopes from 186 to 192. These are nuclei that go from more or less axial rotors or slightly gamma soft rotors to very gamma soft rotors. So in the triangle, they go from somewhere like here up to there. And so all you do is just change chi, okay? And so here's a set of calculations from 186 to 192. And the only thing uh, that I've done is uh, change chi. So down here, chi is minus 1.32. Here it's 0. So from 186 to 192, I've just decreased chi. And if I remember how I did it, I did it linearly. And these are the predictions. There are no predictions for the energy levels. These are the experimental energy levels. And the reason I didn't draw the theoretical ones is because they, you can't distinguish them. They're just the same values. But what you see here are the relative BE2s. <clears throat> so from each level, so let's say this one, this 3 plus of the gamma band, you'll see three BE2 values, one to this 2 plus, one to the 4 plus, one of these arrows is supposed to go to the bottom one, and one to this 2 plus. And the experimental values are 100, 16, and 8.6. And the theoretical ones are 100, 21, and 13. And so you can scan along here. I'm not going to go through it in detail. Um, but um, you can scan along if you care to and look at the slides later. You'll see the agreement is quite good. Okay. As a little anecdote, this was done pretty early in the history of the IBA. And when we first did these calculations, we saw some very huge discrepancies for the 3 plus levels and also for the 5 plus levels. And everything else agreed beautifully. We couldn't understand this. And we talked to the guy who wrote this code, Olaf Skolten, uh, and he went into the code and he found a phase factor wrong in the wave functions for the odd spin states. So the model was actually good enough that when you saw a discrepancy, so when you see a discrepancy, you always try to figure out what it is. In that case, it was a coding mistake. But uh, so it, the point is, it works really well. OK. Now, so, so far, what we've done is done calculations along this leg. Real nuclei are anywhere in the triangle. And we want to talk now a little bit about what happens throughout the triangle. OK? We continue with this Hamiltonian. <clears throat> This afternoon, you're only going to go along this leg, just to keep it simple and hopefully get you out of here quickly. Um, <clears throat> this triangle is a two-dimensional surface, right? Two dimensions. So we're going to need two parameters to describe a point. One of them is kappa over epsilon, which just kappa zero gives you is here. Epsilon zero is here. So kappa over epsilon ranges from 0 to infinity here. And chi is the parameter within the Q operator that takes you up and down this leg. So you can think of chi as an angle, and kappa over epsilon as a criticality parameter, if you want. OK, so we're going to vary those two parameters. And since we have two parameters, we need two observables to pin them down. Remember, these are collective models. They don't predict anything of initio. You have to feed them. We'll talk about that in a minute or two. Um, having a parameter which goes from 0 to infinity is uh, sometimes awkward. If I give one of you a project to calculate 
along this line, changing the parameter by 10% every time, it would take you quite a while to get to infinity. And so typically we make a change of variables and write the Hamiltonian in terms of zeta, uh, which goes from 0 to 1. Now, Jan, Jan must have talked about this, probably with eta. Okay, you weren't listening. So Jan Jolie talked about this same Hamiltonian, I'm sure. He probably had an eta here. He probably had an eta and a 1 minus eta. They're just sort of, one is kappa over epsilon, basically. The other is epsilon over kappa. It doesn't matter. OK, so look at this Hamiltonian. Uh, zeta is related to kappa over epsilon, obviously. And did something change when I click? There we go. Suppose we just have this term. OK, suppose, in other words, suppose zeta, zeta is 0. If zeta is 0, you just have some constant times n sub d. And so that gives you the vibrator limit. OK? Suppose, on the other hand, we have zeta equals 1, and that term goes away, and now you have just deformed nuclei. Deformed nuclei means you're going to be over here, and where you are depends on the chi parameter inside there. And so, a little fancy animation. You've got SU3 spectra here with R42 at 3.33, O6 there with R42 equals 2.5. Okay? So this Hamiltonian very nicely allows you to span anywhere inside the triangle. With zeta going from here to here, it's zero here, it's one over here, and chi goes, what's wrong with this clicker? There. Chi goes up and down like that. As I said this afternoon, we're going to keep epsilon equal to zero, or zeta equal to zero uh, to one, which means we're just going to go up and down along this. That's just to simplify the exercises for you. Okay, so H has two parameters. A given observable can only specify one of them. Okay, so let's look at that. Um, here's the triangle. Let's suppose we have an experimental a, a nucleus with an R42 value of 2.9. So here, R42 is 2.0. Here it's 3.33, and here it's 2.5. OK, we've discussed these. You know this. And this is the vibrator. That's the rotor. And this one turns out is 2.5. So there we have 2.9. OK, so what does this tell us? Well. Here we have 2.0, and here we have 3.33. So somewhere along here, R is going to be 2.9. And so if you listen to people give talks at conferences, sometimes, unfortunately, even in papers, you will see somebody say, ah, R is 2.9, so it's partway between a, a spherical vibrator and a prolate rotor. Is that right? Why is it not right? Can be in a lot of places. It can be what? In a lot of places. It can be in a lot of places. Let's look at one place it could be. So here we have 2.5. Here we have 3.33. So somewhere along here, it's going to be 2.9. OK? Now, let's take a point somewhere. Let's take a, along this line. Mm -hmm. Here it's 2.0. Here it's a value somewhere between 2.9 and 3.33. So it's going to be, let's say, 3.1. So here you have 2.0, here you have 3.1. Somewhere along here in the middle, it's going to be 2.9. So in general, there will be a contour. Mm -hmm. And along that contour, R will be constant. And notice, you know, we talk a lot about R42. And as I've said many times, Whenever I look at a nucleus and I want to get an idea of the structure, the very first thing I do, well, first thing I do is make sure it's even even. <laughs> then I look up R42. And that gives me a lot. But it doesn't give me everything. Because all it tells me is that it varies somewhere from transitional between vibrator and rotor and transitional between axial rotor and actually asymmetric rotor. It could be anywhere in between. So I need another observable that's going to tell me where along this path it is. Okay. So remember that R42 is a great guide, mm -hmm. but it's not everything. OK, so here's the idea of the technique of orthogonal <coughs> crossing contours, OCC. 
So you need two observables, and preferably you'd like them with perpendicular trajectories so you can pinpoint some. So simplest observables R42. These are contours of constant R42 in the triangle. <clears throat> and remember, in principle, you have to calculate this for each boson number because they will differ. So over here it's 2. Over here it's 3.33. Here's this 2.9 we just talked about. Here's 2.2, which is what most experimental vibrators are. Here's 3.3. Notice it varies nonlinearly. And if you go to higher boson number, this region squeezes. And that's one reason why we get phase transitions. If you, for a large boson number, <clears throat> going from 2.5 to 3.3 corresponds to going a couple of millimeters here. And so the structure can change very rapidly. Also notice that if you have a nucleus with an R42 value of 3.31, which most people would say is a perfect rotor, it can actually be quite far from SU3. Okay? So that's R42. Okay. Here, by the way, is 2.5, which is 06, and it's down there somewhere. Okay, so it provides a locus of structure. So let's look at some other observables and see what their contour plots look like. So there's R42. Here's the energy of the first excited. By the way, 0 plus 2 means the first excited 0 plus because the ground state 0 plus 1 over 2 plus 1, and that gives that. Is that going to help us a lot? But, but usually, experimentally, these guys are uh, hard to measure. Hard to measure, but it also doesn't help you much. Because yeah, so these right. contours have the same behavior as these. <coughs> so if I have this ratio and this ratio, I'm going to have some point along here, some contour along here, and some contour along here. It's not going to help much. Yes? Sorry, would you, would you mind just <coughs> explaining again why the phase transition make the alpha to ratio do not vary in the now? Um, just ask the question again. I mean, my question is why you, you said that, that um, we can observe that the alpha to ratio is not varying just linearly, but why, why is it related to the phase transition? Um, suppose I go to a very large boson number. Then I would find a contour here of 2.2. And right there, I would find 3.33. And so a tiny change in the parameters of the Hamiltonian will give you a drastic change in structure. And so that calculation would simulate a phase transition. That's what I meant. OK? Yes? In the AC3 corner, the value of this R4 by 4 half is 3.3, right? 3.33. Oh, okay, 3 point three three. So in that uh, line of this chi chi wang, this? yeah, hello, yeah, in uh, almost up to middle, it's going up to only yes. 3.3. Yes, amazing. So you have to be very careful. If you have an experimental nucleus with an R42 of 3.30, most people would say that's a great rotor, but it not necessarily it can be all the way up there. You have to be careful. OK, so this, this observable doesn't help us much. So let's try another one. Let's try the 2 gamma over the 2 ground, OK? Bummer. Same thing. This is not very good. Let's throw the model out. Let's try one more and hope. Here's the V2 from the second 2 plus to the ground over the first, over the second 2 plus to the first 2 plus. Oh, no. <laughs> so what do we do? We have to do something else. We have to find something. So we have a problem. We have lots of contours that look like this. What we'd like to find is one that goes like this. OK? It turns out, obviously, if it didn't turn out, I wouldn't be here talking about this. <laughs> it turns out that there is one. There's actually a family of them, fortunately. <laughs> If you take one that involves the difference in the intrinsic X energies of these two excited vibrational ones, so this is in traditional language beta band energy minus gamma band, that gives you contours like this. Okay, remember <clears throat> that I told you experimentally the beta band is almost always above the gamma band, like by a factor of 1.5 or so. Look at these contours. 
Here you have values plus 2.9 for this ratio, plus 0.4, okay? So that's what most nuclei look like. Here you have negative values. So down here, the beta band is actually below the gamma band. And there's a line in here where it's zero. And so this immediately tells you that most of the formed nuclei are going to be up here somewhere. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. All right, so this is great. So we can plot those, make these contours. And then we can do the following. So we have a triangle. We calculate R42 for the correct boson number, which involves, by the way, a thousand calculations or so because you have to do a mesh. But it's easy if you just set up a script. And here we have this. And now suppose we have some experimental value for R42 like that. Suppose we have an experimental value for this like this. And then through the magic of PowerPoint, <laughs> boing, <laughs> that gives us the parameters for the calculation. Okay, now, does that work perfectly? No, but it gives you a starting point. And once you get that starting point, you can then fine-tune around it. And if you get good agreement, that's fine. If you don't get good agreement, you have to worry about why not. Maybe you need other terms in the Hamiltonian. Maybe something else is going on, but this is at least a starting point. Okay, and here's one example. These are the data on platinum-194. The whole bunch of energy levels and a whole bunch of the E2 values, and those of you who are experimentalists who deal with gamma ray spectroscopy, you're used to having the width of the transition arrows be the gamma ray intensity. Here it's the BE2 value, so. Okay, and then over here, in a second, I'm going to show you a calculation of this, which is just a two-parameter calculation. There are about 30 or 40 observables here, and it's pretty bloody good. It's been done by my former student, Virgie Checkerly, for this symbol. And so the model really can work quite well. Okay, if you do that for a lot of nuclei, so, point. Okay, this shows a mapping of the rare earth nuclei. Don't worry about this thing. This is where the beta and gamma bands are degenerate. Um, and so this, and this is the phase transition that you saw. So this is how the different nuclei evolved. Now, if you remember, I've told you many, many times, these collective models tell you what a nucleus is doing, but not why. To understand why, you have to go deeper into some microscopic theory of why this happens. And so that's, whoops, that's the complementarity of macroscopic and microscopic. Another question is what happens in exotic nuclei? Okay, we haven't discussed that too much in this course, but everything you've learned is a prolegomenon to any future studies of exotic nuclei. Um, <clears throat> and so what happens far from stability with these mappings is we don't know. Okay. Fortunately, you don't need too much data to be able to pinpoint at least approximately where the nucleus is. Just okay. A, just one question. Uh, there is any kind of uh, studies that associate uh, those kind of uh, studies with the mass of each nucleus? I mean, I noticed It doesn't relate much to mass. Yeah, it does relate yeah. to the va number of valence nuclei. Okay. But the point is that I noticed that <coughs> sometimes we need to fix the mass of the nucleus when we have transitions between symmetries. And okay, I so um, everything I've talked about so far has to do with excitation energies and transition rates. If you want to calculate masses with the IBA, you need to include terms back further in the group chain that depend on the boson number. Okay, and there are three of those terms. I haven't included them. If you want to study masses with the IBA, you have to include those. <coughs> Plus these terms. Okay. I, I think he's asking that rather than plotting lines of constant Z to do lines of constant A. Oh, is that what you meant? Oh, I've never done that. That might be interesting. I never thought to do that. You know why we plot lines of constant Z? Exactly. 
It's exactly right. Why don't we plot lines of constant n? Because we don't have names for them. Erbium has 68 protons. 100 neutrons doesn't have a name. And in our minds, we always tend to think in terms of names. I learned this the first time I went to China. They would show me a temple and they'd say, this is the heaven temple, because it was tall. And then they'd say, this is the blue temple, because the tiles are blue. And I thought, this is stupid. I mean, it's sort of obvious. And then I realized it's really not. Once you name something, uh, it, it, it somehow it grabs you. So, yeah, I've never done that. That could be interesting. Okay, now, now we're getting close to the practical aspects. Um, you're going to use the talent server, but I'm not sure after you leave whether you'll be able to use it. I don't know if they will, Mary. Or something like two months. Okay. Anyway, if you want to do IBA calculations, which you all should want to do, mm -hmm. <laughs> after you can collect, connect to the server at Yale and just do SSH. It's called Titan. So it's titan.physics.yale.edu. The username is phy664, port 22. The password is nuclear underscore codes. It sounds like something for a, a, a Star Wars. <laughs> 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 It, it doesn't mean the thing that sets off the bomb. It just means computer codes. <laughs> and you just do the directory CD fin damage you'll do today. And you can pico the file name, dot in. And when you're finished editing, you do control X and yes and then return. You do run fin file name, no dot in, without extension. Pico file name out. And that's all you really have to do. This will be on the slides you'll, you'll get, so you can do that. And if anybody wants to try it and has problems, uh, just contact me. This server, Titan, is very, very old. <laughs> Not like me, but I mean, it's old. And so there's no guarantee how long it will live. We have a backup one called Hyperion, but it has a couple of little problems. Anyway, try this if you want. Okay. Now we're getting into the practical stuff. And... Um, I want to show you what the output looks like, because you're going to do IBA calculations this afternoon. This is not what the output looks like, because the output is longer, and so I cut and pasted some key parts. But this is basically the idea. So when you do a calculation, you will see up here just simply a reflection of the input. This is the input file, and I will explain that later. Okay. And what you're going to do when you start the exercise this afternoon is start with three very, very, very simple cases. Okay? And then you'll do an actual fit to Erbium. What you can see up here, this is, the, this is the really important part. This is epsilon, this is kappa, and this is chi. This is the number of bosons. This is the maximum angular momentum you want to calculate. This, you don't worry about. This, you just set by. The only important thing on this line is print equals point t point. If you keep print equals point t point, it prints out all the wave functions. Okay, and if you're doing 16 bosons, which is what you'll do, that's going to give you a long, long output. In the beginning, you should do that a few times to get familiar with the wave functions. But after a while, you might want to change that to point f point. <clears throat> In which case, it doesn't print out the wave functions. The output's much shorter. Okay, that's the input. The output... It goes spin by spin. So first it gives you the results for spin 0, and then spin 2. There's no 1 plus in the IBA, remember the M scheme. And then spin 3 and 4 and so on, up to this IAM. Okay, so this afternoon you will set this to 16. This will be 8. And this will be point T in the beginning and then point F. This part of the input gives you transition rates, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, so the first thing it does is, for zero plus states, it gives you the basis vectors. Now, if you're going to calculate wave functions, you have to express them in some basis, right? The basis that's almost always used in the IBA is the U5 basis. Okay, so you write the wave functions for wherever you are in the triangle in terms of a basis that uses the states of the U5 limit, the vibrator limit, where ND is a good quantum number. Okay, and here are the basis states. And let me explain the labeling. You don't need to know most of these numbers. So we're talking about zero plus states, so they will all have zero plus spin. 
the first basis state has zero D bosons. And that's, for the moment, I would only really worry about that. Forget these. Zero D bosons. Now, you can't make a zero plus with one D boson, right? Because it has angular momentum two. So there's no zero plus state with one D boson. But the two phonon triplet here has a two and a zero. So you can make a D boson, uh, you can make a zero plus with two D bosons. So there's a basis state with two D bosons. There's one with three, four, five. Actually, there are two ways to do it with six. Okay? Question? No, okay. So that's the basis. <clears throat> these are the predicted energies. Okay, now these energies should actually already be obvious to you. Why those numbers? We have nothing in the Hamiltonian except epsilon. This is a U5 prediction. So the ground state will be at zero. First excited zero plus state will be at 0.4 because the boson energy is 0.2, so it's just two times it. And then you'll have one at 0.6, 0.8, 1, the 2 at 1.2 because there are two ways of doing that. Is that clear? It's just simply the vibrator spectrum. And the eigenvectors, <coughs> since we're doing a calculation which is a U5 calculation, we only have epsilon in the Hamiltonian, and we're writing the wave functions in U5, it's just going to be ones. Okay? All right, and then it goes to spin two, spin three, spin four. And when I say this isn't the output, I truncated some of this stuff just to get it all on the page. And then it gives you the BE2 values. Now, this calculation only has uh, two to zero and four to two. And so this is the BE2 value from the first two plus to the, first, to the ground state, six arbitrary units. And um, <clears throat> first two plus state to the second zero plus is point is two. <laughs> and so on, you can see them. It gives it the other way, in case you're interested in that. And then here's the 4 to 2. And notice this, the 2 to 0 is 6, the 4 to 2 is 10. This is 6 bosons and it's U5. Anybody remember the ratio? Remember when I did this, I said it was 2 in the vibrator, and in the IBA it was 1 and 1.67. You remember that number from earlier? Well, there you see, whoops. There you actually see it, 10, 6. Okay? All right. Okie dokie? All right. Now, next calculation I'm going to show you is SU3. I want to make a comment about SU3 first. So SU3 is going to involve the operator QQ. This is the quadruple operator, and QQ is just two of them. And now let's just multiply these terms together and see what we get in terms of D bosons. <clears throat> so, this term times this, and I'm not worrying about normal order, I just want to see what it does to the D boson number, is S dagger D times S dagger D. What does that do? That destroys two D bosons and creates two S bosons. So that changes N sub D by minus two. Then you have S dagger D times D dagger S. That doesn't change the number of D bosons. And then you have S dagger D times D dagger D which will decrease the number of D bosons by one. Okay, clear? And plus other terms. And so now if you think about the vibrator limit, because we're going to write these wave functions in terms of U5 basis, here you have zero phonons, one, one D boson, two D bosons. These terms, like this one, which change the number of D bosons by one, will mix those two plus states. So the vibrator states will be mixed. So the wave functions for SU3 will not have ones along the diagonal when we write it in a U5 basis. They'll have other numbers relating to the strength of this interaction. Is that clear? So any calculation deviating from, U, deviating from U5 will give wave functions where ND is no longer a good quantum number. If the wave function is expressed in a U5 basis, which the computer program does, by the way, we have programs that express in other bases, but this is the normal one. Then it will contain a mixture of terms. Okay, so here's an output for SU3. If you remember SU3, the Hamiltonian is just QQ, so there's only kappa, and chi is minus the square root of 7 over 2, which is 1.3229. Okay, here are the basis states for 0 plus, the same basis states. Here are the energies, now they're very different. 
And look at the wave functions. They're all totally mixed. Okay? Are you leaving? <laughs> Forever? <laughs> okay, bye. Oh, did you ever find those on your server? I will uh, Okay. All right, so now you see, oh, by the way, you read these down. Okay, so the first zero plus state, these are the basis states, these are the amplitudes. And you see that um, they're, uh, uh, they're all mixed. Okay? And here are the other results. Now, if you look at the energies, you'll notice the first two plus energy is 45 kilovolts. The four plus is 150. That ratio is 3.33. Okay. Uh, oh, one warning. You'll see here at the bottom binding energy. In principle, you can use that to calculate the mass or the corrections to the mass of the nucleus. Do not, one second, do not do that. There's a mistake in the code for this number, which we've corrected, but not in the form of the program you're going to use. So do not use that. Yes? So your, your argument for why these mix was that this QQ operator can change ND by 2. And NS the other way. And NS, but how can, say for example, the 6 uh, ND state be mixed with the 0 ND state? Um, oh, you, you mean why do you have amplitudes all the way up and down? Yeah, like how does oh, it get... Because, that's easy, because the ND equals 6 state will be mixed with the ND equals 4 state, which will be mixed with the ND equals 2 state which would be mixed with the ND equals zero. It's just multi-state mixing. In the very first afternoon, you did a mathematical calculation with uh, five by five, and you saw things were all mixed together. Yeah, but if you just apply this operator once, I would think there'd only be one link between the... No. Just do, do a three by three calculation with your favorite code, and just put in... Do uh, you know the answer yet? They're not there. Okay, we'll, we'll worry about that. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, bye, Mallory. <laughs> Say hi to Ani. Um, just do a calculation. We have three levels, a matrix only between the second and third of one, matrix only between the first and second of one, and you'll see that all three mix. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. For some reason, I was thinking the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian will have zeros, but all of the... I yeah. yeah. Okay. Was there a question back there? Uh, no, I wait for my Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's actually true. Here's 06. 06 is just kappa, and in this case, chi is zero. Is the question now? Where? Ah. Uh, when we uh, get the algorithm in the software, there is uh, any way to measure the amount of uh, of uh, mistakes that we are <laughs> adding to the code? I mean, because when when we are starting writing the Hamiltonian, this is analytically. But when we discretize the algorithm, I am pretty sure that we are adding uh, something wrong in the in the algorithm in the software. Okay. Not in the model. That's a very good point. Not in the and, and, uh, let me come back actually to uh, this SU3 calculation. Um, the quadrupole quadrupole operator in the Hamiltonian mixes the U5 basis states. Epsilon is zero in the Hamiltonian. Okay? Um, whenever you have degenerate states, um, no, let me say it differently. Let's take the um, U5 Hamilton. Okay? So that has pure uh, states. Now, let me say it differently. Whenever you diagonalize a matrix with a computer code, you try to get zeros on the off diagonal. The code never gets to zero. It stops at some preset value like 10 to the minus 8. But if the states happen to be degenerate, an interaction of 10 to the minus 8 with degenerate states will give you infinite mixing. And so, clear? If I take two states that are degenerate at 0 keV and mix them with an interaction which is 1 microelectron volt, 
they will infinitely mix. Okay. So when you have states like SU3, which where you have both, remember in SU3 the beta and gamma bands are degenerate. So these two come out at the same energy. You have to be careful because the computer program will make a mistake. The computer program will stop diagonalizing when the off-diagonal A matrix elements are like 10 to the minus 8. So what we do, now Pete is not going to like this. Um, what I do when I do an SU3 calculation is I put in an epsilon of like 0 0.00001, just a, an electron volt or so. And that's enough to break the degeneracy. And so you're, you're right, you can get mistakes, but except for that one situation, they're negligible. Okay, the diagonalization is pretty good. Now, Pete doesn't like putting in an epsilon because of some fancy theory. <laughs> he would prefer to do it with chi, I guess. It's an arbitrary splitting. So yeah. You can put a really perturbation in this. Okay. But do you accept to put in it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> but you would probably do it with chi. Okay. Oh, oops. Okay, so here's 06. Now, let me go back to here for a second. Actually, I'm almost done. Wow. Um, Okay, notice what we did here. And now think about 06. In 06, chi is 0. So this term here is 0 instead. And so now you don't get terms like this, the ones involving d dagger d. So then delta n sub z, delta n d is changed by either 0 or 2. So you're not going to get the same kind of mixing of the wave functions in 06. Right? In SU3, you have terms in this Hamiltonian the change ends of d by minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2. In 06, without this term, you're only going to get 2 and 0. And so it's not surprising then if you look at the wave functions that you have some zeros here. In SU3, they're all totally mixed. In 06, you still have some zeros because some, some of the basis states are not mixed. Okay. That is what I want to talk about the IVA. And if you remember the title of this thing was other topics. And on the, your evaluation sheet, it says practical IBM and the zoo. Okay, the zoo is a zoo of topics I just want to briefly talk about that are sort of random. They're just things that occurred to me as I listened to the lectures, points I thought might be nice to make. So you've got to make a change here. We're not talking about the IBA anymore. Okay, this afternoon, what we'll do, let me just tell you briefly what we'll do. We will start with three simple calculations. One, the vibrator limit, and then we'll perturb it slightly, and then we'll perturb it more. And we, when we perturb it slightly, when we do the uh, U5 limit, we'll see ones here. Okay? When we perturb it slightly, you'll see numbers like 0 0.96, 0 0.98, 0.03 and things like that. You'll see just a little bit of mixing. When we perturb it by a lot, you'll see much more mixing. And then you will do a fit to the structure of Erbium 168. And the idea there is, I'm going to go way back. This won't take long. This is just to review this one. Got it? Here we go. So this afternoon, in your exercises, you will see this table. But in here, there will be a column called Talent Students. And I will put hundreds in here. Uh, the the interband ones won't be there. So one of these will be normalized to 100. And you will do a fit and fill in the rest. OK, and this column will give you the answers you should aim for. OK. So that will be the exercise. Very, very simple. You just vary chi. Should take you 10 minutes. Well, that's a lie. I love that one. <laughs> By the way, I'm sorry, Mark. I have to fix this. Everything from here back through there is one slide. I'm going to have to move some labels, uh, uh, overlays.
Okay. Um, we talked a lot about the proton-neutron interaction and how important it is in driving collectivity and deformation. And the question is, can we measure it? Is it actually measurable? Does it correlate with onset of collectivity and deformation? And so I want to show you that we can. Now, truth in advertising, this is stuff I did, so I'm biased towards it. But nevertheless, it's wonderful. Uh, so the question is, how, is there a way to measure the proton-neutron interaction? The answer is yes, using masses. We talked about masses before and how differences of masses give you separation energies, which tell you something about single nucleon energies or two nucleon energies. Double differences of masses can be constructed which isolate particular physics. And so let me give you an example. So here I have something called delta VPN, which means the valence proton-neutron interaction energy between the last proton and the last neutron. And it's given by a double difference of four masses. Okay? And let me illustrate why it gives you the proton-neutron interaction. So this is the binding energy of a nucleus with Z protons and N neutrons. And I'm going to depict that in a shell model diagram as these levels filled, so that would be filled at n minus 2 and z minus 2, with two last protons and two last neutrons. From that, I subtract the binding energy of the nucleus with z protons and n minus 2 neutrons. So I'm going to subtract this nucleus from this. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here, starting with z minus 2. Okay? So, what does this difference give you? When I subtract the binding energy of this nucleus from this, that gives you the interaction of the last two neutrons with all of the protons, with all of the other neutrons, and with each other. Everything else cancels out. Because I've got all the interactions of all the protons with each other there. They just cancel. Same thing with the n minus 2 neutrons. They just cancel. And the only thing that's left is the interaction of the last two neutrons with all of the protons with all of the other neutrons and with each other. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. When I do this difference, that's going to give me the interaction of the last two neutrons with Z minus 2 protons, because now they're only Z minus 2, with all the other N minus 2 neutrons and with each other. Okay? And now when I subtract this from this, I'm subtracting the interaction of the last two neutrons with Z minus two protons, with N minus two neutrons, and with each other, from the interaction of the last two neutrons with Z protons, with N minus two neutrons, and with each other. So this bottom line cancels out, and what we're left with is the interaction of the last two neutrons with the last two protons. Okay? And divide by one four by four and you get the average empirical interaction of the last two neutrons with the last two protons. So you can get this from measured masses. And here's what the data look like. Uh, this is the entire nuclear chart. And these are the values ranging from a few MeV, attractive, up to zero. And you see some very interesting features here. These spikes all occur. Who, who, know, who can think of what those spikes might be? We have suddenly enhanced proton-neutron interactions. Mm. Mm. Sorry? No, these are only even even. Sorry? No. Even the uh, N equals Z nuclei. Okay, now Pete would probably say... That's not quite the proton-neutron interaction. It's other things, right? Even though you have an earlier paper saying it is the proton-neutron interaction. <laughs> the one with Dave and Bentley. No, Dave, we don't. We saw the... No, no, no. Okay, he didn't. Okay. <laughs> anyway, whatever. Whether it is or isn't, you see these singularities for N equals Z nuclei. It would be very interesting to see what happens with exotic nuclei as we go up towards 50. I'm not going to worry about whoops. I'm not going to worry about that. Here you see that they're pretty smooth. And by the way, that general overall smoothness is one of the post facto 
justifications for the NPNN scheme, where we ignored the differences in proton-neutron interactions in different orbits. Nevertheless, you can see little effects. And these effects, th this slide was made around 1990. There have been a lot of mass measurements since then. And this little region, oh, do I show it? No, I don't show it. All right. This little region now has about 20 nuclei in it. And there's some very interesting variations, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, what I want to do is something else. Uh, I want to talk about trying to get a feeling for what the proton-neutron interaction will be, depending on what orbits the protons and neutrons are in. So imagine that I have protons filling some low orbits in this shell, and neutrons filling low orbits in this shell. So the low orbits in any shell in the independent particle model have high angular momentum and low principal quantum number. So if I have a proton here and a neutron there, they're going to be in rather similar orbits. And they'll have high spatial similarity, large interaction energy. On the other hand, if I have a proton here and a neutron up there, then I'm going to have a high J angular momentum single particle level with low principal quantum number. And up here, I'm going to have a low J orbit, like P a half or something, with a high principal quantum number. They will overlap less. Okay, so as a general feature, you can imagine that the proton-neutron interaction should be strongest if the two shells are filling roughly in parallel. Okay. Here's the data. This is color-coded data for the region from neutron number 82 to 126, proton 50 to 82. The red boxes are the largest interactions, and the blue boxes are the smallest. And you see this feature works out really beautifully. The diagonal, which corresponds to filling the two shells approximately equally, has the largest values. Up here, which is a whole particle, where the neutrons are filling the first half of the shell and the protons are filling the last half, you have the smallest values. Okay, so that works, works like you'd expect. And so the empirical interaction strengths are indeed strongest along the diagonal. Also, they're stronger in like regions than unlike. Here you have both protons and neutrons in the first half of the shell. Here you have both in the second half. Here you have one in the first half and one in the second half. And so they're stronger here than there. Okay. The, this also correlates with the evolution of structure. This shows R42 for nuclei in this, these two quadrants here. And you'll see that R42 starts less than 2, as it should, and it goes up to 3.33. The blue points correspond to nuclei up here. And the red points correspond to nuclei here. Here, the proton-neutron interaction is larger. And so it should take fewer proton-neutron interactions to get the same amount of collectivity. Here, the proton-neutron interaction is smaller, so it should take more of them. I plotted this against NPNN. And you'll notice the blue curve, for the most part, is shifted towards higher NPNN values. So to get a given R42, it takes more valence protons and neutrons if you're in this region than if you're in this, because the proton-neutron interaction is larger here. OK, that's the end of that topic. This is a zoo, so you've got to compartmentalize your brains, and we're going to switch topics. I may have shown this briefly, but I wanted to show it again. It, because it, it gives a general philosophical message that looking at things from different perspectives can yield different ideas. Okay? So this is a plot, very simple data, R42 against neutron number in the rare earth region. And what do you see? You see, anybody, what, anybody want to tell me what they see? As you go across the plot, what happens to the structure? Mm. What do you have here? What kind of structure here? Sorry? Yeah? What do you have up here where it's about 3.33? So what do you have? You have the onset of deformation. Okay? That's about all you can say from this plot unless you really look in detail. Okay? Now I'm going to take the same data and plot it instead of against neutron number against protons. And now you get this. Oh. 
Oh, wonder that. That makes my day. <laughs> okay, what does this tell you? Well, you have values like 1.8 or 2, so that's spherical. You have values up around 3.33, so that's deformed. So somehow you see the onset of deformation, right? Clear? But you see more. You see it as a phase transition. Because look, here you have concave shapes. These are now a constant neutron number. You have concave shapes and you have convex shapes. And you have a sudden change from concave to convex between 88 and 90 neutrons. Okay? Clear? Okay, now, think a little more. R42 is lowest uh, near magic numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And it's highest near mid-shell. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Z equals 64. So Z equals 64, you have a minimum in R42 for neutron numbers 84, 86, and 88. So that means that Z equals 64 is almost like a magic number for those neutron numbers. Okay? And if you remember when we first talked about the independent particle model, I told you the neutron number, or proton numbers 40 and 64 were sometimes magic. It's the gap between the D5 halves, G7 halves protons, and the H11 halves. When I add more neutrons and go up to neutron number 90, then I have a maximum in R42. Where do you get a maximum? At mid-shell. So now you see that what's going on here is that you have Z equals 64 going from a like a magic number to like mid-shell. And it is almost mid-shell between 50 and 82. <clears throat> so you see the onset of deformation as a phase transition mediated by a change in proton shell structure as a function of neutron number and hence driven by the proton-neutron interaction. So same data, but you get much more in the way of insights by looking at it this way. Having seen this, you can go back here and look at these crossings and see the same thing, but it's not so obvious. So the message is not this particular point, but just always try to turn things around and look at them in different ways. And it's not just, it's formally it's equivalent to look at it different ways, but in practice you often get insights. Okie dokie. Um, a couple of comments on testing theories. Remember in the first set of exercises on Monday three weeks ago, I showed you a couple of pictures of imaginary data and two theories is that which theory is the best or which is the worst. Mm -hmm. I just want to go a little further along that way. And look at what the key observables are for testing models because I want to make an important point. So here I have a typical level scheme for a deformed nucleus. Ground state rotational band, gamma band, beta band. And suppose you're going to test some theory. You might think, well, let's do a chi-squared fit. Okay? And the question is, what happens if you do that? If you include all levels and all the transitions, I claim that you're going to get a biased result. And I'll tell you the reason. So first, let's say, what are the key observables that tell you about the structure? By now, you should know that these spacings, R42, are a key to telling you what the structure is. The vibrational energies, oops, excuse me, gamma vibrational energy and the zero plus energy are key to telling you about intrinsic vibrational modes in the nucleus. The staggering of gamma band energies, two, three, four, five, tells you about gamma softness. These branching ratios compared to the oligo rules can tell you about band mixing. The absolute BE2s can tell you about the collectivity. And those are kind of the key things. Fitting the 6 plus, 8 plus, 10 plus, 5 plus, 6 plus, 7 plus, 2 plus, 4 plus, 6 plus doesn't add too much. If you can fit the first few levels of the, of the ERAS band, and of course I'm talking about below any back bend, your, most models are going to do pretty well on the higher ones. And if you do a blind chi-squared, you're going to run into trouble, you can, by overweighting the same physics again and again and underweighting other physics. So be careful. Don't do blind chi-squares. Think about what you're doing. And the exercises on the first Monday gave you examples of that. Uh, the other thing in the Monday exercises was I had one case where one energy level was far more precise than the others, and that chi-square just weighted everything anomalously. Okay, so that's that message. 
Um, this is a message about how to look at discrepancies with models and try to see what they're telling you. The models we've been talking about are very simple. Any models you're going to deal with are very simple. Because no matter who's doing the calculations, we're very far from having really good models in nuclear theory. And so you're going to have discrepancies. And what do you do when you have discrepancies? You just say they're discrepancies. Sometimes you can analyze them a little more in detail. So this was the X5 scheme for Sumerian 152, and this was the data. And I use this just to illustrate it, not to talk about X5. Oops. Overall, it was quite good agreement. Remember, it's parameter free. But there were two very obvious discrepancies. These, the 2 plus was much higher than this. The 4 plus was much higher than this. And these BE2 values didn't agree with those very well. And so you can just stop there, or you can try to understand a little better what's going on. So let's look at that. So here I just summarized. This is X5, and this is the data. And so let's look at energies, first of all. So we have this 2 plus disagreeing with that and the 4 plus. If you just take it as individual levels not agreeing with experiment, you stop there. But maybe you can do something more. And so what I've done here is plot these predicted energies compared with X5 by normalizing this energy difference. Okay, And so that's going to test whether the discrepancies are a series of unrelated discrepancies or whether it's just a scale factor. And what you see is that the ratios of energies in this excited band, these diamonds, are exactly X5. And, so, and, and that's for the ground band, sorry. And this is for the excited band. So the excited band is as good an X5 set of ratios as the ground band. And what that tells you is something very important. It's not just a set of random discrepancies. It isolates the fact that the discrepancies relate to a scale factor. And once you know that, you might try to think of ways to improve that. And Mark Caprio has done that. This is the X5 potential well, square well. And what he said is, it's not reasonable. That's an extreme example. You're not going to have a nucleus where the, the potential is so fixed. Wouldn't it be better to have a sloped outer wall, some softness in beta at the outer side? And so he did a calculation. And you can see what happens. In here, this potential well is not so different than this one, so not much happens. Out here, this potential well is much wider. And so when you have a wide well, the wavelengths of the Wave functions can be longer, and the energies will come down. So these energies will come down compared to the pure X5. And he's able to actually account for these differences. Whether that's the explanation or not, I don't care. The point is you can, once you've identified it as only a scale factor, you can try to figure out why. Okay. Uh, the other problem was the BE2s. Here we have 10 BE2s that differ from these 10 experimental ones. And what's the point? So. Again, let's normalize. Let's normalize this one to this. And so these are set equal. And actually, here I include three nuclei. And now what you see is, as I go different spins, different transitions, they're almost all equal. So these discrepancies are mostly a, uh, a scale factor again. The theoretical ones are about three times larger than the experimental. And now that we realize that it's not just a sequence of 10 discrepancies, but a scale, we can go back and look at something. You will notice that the R42 ratio for X5 is 2.91. The data is 3.01. So that means this nucleus is a little bit on the rotor side of the critical point. It's a little bit more toward the rotor. If you remember in SU3, transitions from these bands to the ground are forbidden. And so what you're seeing here, maybe, is that because this nucleus is a little bit on the rotor side of the phase transition, you have a drop in these BE2 values compared to X5 because you're closer to the region where these are forbidden. Okay, whether that's the explanation or not, I don't actually care. Well, I care, but I don't care for these lectures. Okay, uh, parameters. Counting parameters is a tricky business. And sometimes they're hidden, but I just want to give you an example of how tricky it could be. Suppose I have a ground band, a gamma band, and a beta band. And suppose I get disagreement with the data, and I say, okay, let's do band mixing and see if we can fix it. 
Okay? So the question is, how many parameters do I need to do this? How many do you think? To do a band mixing calculation with these three bands and try to reproduce the energies and the BE2 values. Somebody say a number. I huh? think maybe you just try one first and okay. then keep increasing. So let's look at the number of parameters you need. You need 10 as a minimum. You need the energies of these two, the unperturbed energies of these two excitations. You don't know them to begin with. You need the rotational spacing, h bar squared over 2 on it. And even if I assume it's the same for these bands, I still need to know what that is. I need to know what the interest of the scale of intraband BE2s is. So that's that scale. And I can assume it's the same here and here, but if I really want to do it, it's even more parameters. I need to know what the unperturbed values of the gamma to ground and beta to gamma and beta to ground BE2s are. Those are all input parameters I need. And then I need the band mixing matrix sum. Gamma ground, beta gamma, beta ground. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 parameters. And that assumes that the rotational energies here and here are the same, and the rotational BE2s are the same. So if I break that, then I've got 15 parameters. So be careful when you use any model to think about how many parameters. Parameters are not necessarily bad if they're mandated by the data. Okay. So why do some models have so many parameters and others have so few? The above 10 to 15 parameter calculation gets approximately comparable agreement to the IBA with its two parameters or three. What does that tell you? It, it may not tell you exactly what you think it tells you. They're both describing the same physical system. The IBA has only two or three parameters, but there's something hidden under the, under the rug in the IBA. It assumes a huge truncation of the shell model, the S and D bosons. That ansatz is itself a choice. It's a choice to set all the 26 of the 3 times 10 to the 14 configurations to zero. Okay? So it has some assumptions built into it. Okay? So you can think of models as searches to select the appropriate degrees of freedom. And those are effectively physics-based parameterizations that don't appear as explicit parameters. Success or failure of those models can tell you about the ansatzes in the physics. Just think about these things as you do comparisons between theory and experiment. OK, here's the history of nuclear structure. Uh, slight oversimplification. And, and I want to, I'm doing this to make a point. These are dates. In the 50s and 60s, most of the nuclear structure studies were in light nuclei. And then from the 70s onward, they got to heavier nuclei. Does anybody know why? Why in the 40s and 50s didn't we study heavy nuclei as much? Um, heavy IB. Sorry? We don't have that heavy IB. Exactly. We didn't have accelerators that could produce high enough energies of heavy ion nuclei to overcome the Coulomb barrier. So we were limited to studying nuclei with low Coulomb barriers, namely down here. Once we developed tandems and cyclotrons and so on that could get over the Coulomb barrier, we began to study these. The development of gamma ray detector arrays really advanced this area. And so that, that really was a huge explosion of, of data. Nowadays, that's the tens, we're still going out here towards super heavy nuclei. And we're still doing studies here. I mean, we've talked about a lot of them. But a lot of the interest has turned back around to these light nuclei. And the reason is that we can now go out far from stability. We have weak contaminated beams at fewer levels, but we have uh, new instruments. And so in a sense, it's back to the future. OK, we're going back, and a lot of the emphasis is on light nuclei. OK, and many techniques from the 60s, such as transfer reactions, to look at single and two nucleon structure are being revived, and Augusto's lecture uh, really brought that home. Uh, they're often done in inverse kinematics, which I won't go into if you don't know what it is. An important point is the intensities of exotic nuclear beams are orders and orders and orders and orders and orders and orders of magnitude weaker, often a million times weaker. And so we have to develop 
very sensitive instruments to study them, but we can do that. Okay, I'm almost done, which is, I'll end a little early. Uh, this is the logo from the talent website, right? And I want to make a comment down here about a triple revolution that's occurred in nuclear physics. And it's driving what's going on. First revolution, not first, but the first one I mentioned is accelerator technology. In the last 20 years, 25 years, there's been an explosion in the ability to build accelerators that can accelerate and um, uh, produce exotic nuclei through collisions. Without that, we wouldn't be studying nuclear for our own But those beams we get are often, instead of nanoamps, 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 10th particles per second, they're often 1,000 particles per second, or 100, or 10, or 1, or 1 per day. Okay? And so we need, we need a revolution in instrument technology to be able to do the experiments. You can, when I was a kid, kid is like your age, um, I did Coulomb excitation with beams of 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th particles per second. Now it's common to do it with 200 particles per second. So that's instrument technology. And the third revolution is advances in computing. And that has two aspects. On the experimental side, with these weak beams and uh, the, the complicated experimental um, instrumentation with, with gamma ray detection, particle detection, massive amounts of data, you need advances in computing to deal with the experiments. Often each event is analyzed as it comes in. And then you need it for theory. Most or many of the theories we've talked about in this course, you can do by hand or with mathematic or with a simple model that runs in a millisecond. But if you look at it more globally, the vast majority of nuclear theory these days is actually using advanced computing. And that's the microscopic, Abenizio, cluster shell model, density functional theory, all that kind of stuff. And that is critically dependent on advances in computing. And so these three um, revolutions are leading, I think, to the brightest future in nuclear physics in, in at least half a century. And I think the next slide is my last one. Yes. So a quick perspective on theory today. Most of our theories were developed based on data using stable beams and targets. So the shell model was based on the known magic numbers in the 1940s. Okay? And the other collective models were based on nuclear and near stability. Off stability, especially on the neutron rich side, which, is, which extends further, uh, we find that those models are breaking down. We find the magic numbers are breaking down, shell gaps are different, all sorts of things are different. And as you've seen in these three weeks, we have a zoo of models for different phenomena. You have heard about probably 10 or 15 different models. Right? And they're all wonderful models that work in certain situations. But ideally, we'd like to have a single coherent nuclear theory. And we don't have that. People are working towards it. Not me, because I can't. But people are. And when we get that model, it may be that our current models are, in some hand-waving sense, projections of that theory onto the nuclei near stability. They will find that the models we developed earlier for nuclear near stability are kind of one limit of that more general theory. And so my final message is achieving that goal is the challenge of your generation. So go forth and do great things. Thank you. Last lecture.